Senator, the, the president has put your name on a list of potential Supreme Court justices that he would name. Do you want the job? I, you know, I don't. I, it, it is deeply honoring. It's humbling to, to be included in the list. I'm, I'm grateful that the president uh, has that confidence in me. Uh, but but it's, it's not the desire of my heart. I want to be in the political fight. I want to be fighting to nominate and confirm three, four, five principled constitutionalist justices. But, but th th that's not, not where I want to serve. Yeah. I want to stay fighting right where I am in the U.S. Senate. Well, Senator, I want to ask you about some of those fights. I mean, we had news this week in terms of John Durham's investigation. Got to get your take there. And you've been very vocal on China. New developments there as well. Plus, your script act with regard to entertainment. Got to get your take on this Netflix show, Cuties, which is uh, all the talk right now. Stay with us. We'll slip in a break. We are talking with Senator Ted Cruz this morning. We will get the latest efforts to hold Beijing accountable as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. We're back in a moment. I want to get your take on the latest polls and how you're feeling about the Senate. I've been speaking uh, to a number of CEOs and business managers lately, and they are concerned that the Republicans could lose the majority this coming November. Where are the risks and what do you feel is most important uh, in terms of uh, the vote in 50 days now? Well, Maria, I'm very concerned about this election. I think it is exceptionally volatile, uh, and I think it depends on what happens over the next two months. Uh, I, I think if we see people starting to go back to work, I think if we see a renewed sense of hope and optimism, we could have a phenomenally good election. We could see the president reelected by an even bigger margin than last time. We could see Republicans growing our majority in the Senate. We could even see Republicans retaking the House of Representatives. And I'm fighting hard for all of those to happen. But on the other hand, if in the next two months uh, we see more people losing their jobs, more shutdowns, we see COVID numbers going up, if people are depressed and demoralized, if they're giving up hope, we could see a terrible election. We could see an absolute bloodbath where where, where Biden wins the presidency and, and we wake up and Chuck Schumer is the majority leader and Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. And, and I got to tell you, Maria, the damage that a Biden Schumer Pelosi government would do, I think in two years would exceed the damage that Barack Obama and Joe Biden did in eight years. And, and, and yeah. I don't recall an election in my lifetime where there was so much delta, so much volatility between a very good yeah. election and, and a Watergate-level catastrophic election. I don't know which one it's going to be, which means the stakes right now are enormously high. They are enormously high. You, you've come out with your own bill to safely reopen the economy, get kids back to school. I know that school choice is very important to you, and you would expect that that's very important to suburban women, which has been one of the cautious or weak spots for President Trump. Talk about school choice here and why you believe that is and may ultimately resonate uh, with, uh, with voters. Well, I, I think school choice is the civil rights issue of the 21st century, and, and, I, and I think it is particularly poignant right now. We've got 56 million school kids all across America, and, and right now a whole lot of kids, a whole lot of families, a whole lot of moms and dads are, are, are hurting. You know, as you know, Heidi and I, we've got two little girls. They're, they're 9 and 12 years old. Since March, they've been distance learning at home, and so for most of the time I've been working here at home, here sitting in this living room. Heidi has been working in her office from home, and, and we've had Catherine, our fourth grader, she's been on the kitchen table doing distance learning. Caroline, our seventh grader, has been in her bedroom doing distance learning. You know, that's hard, and that's hard, and we've got two parents who've been able to work at home who are able to help both girls uh, get online, stay engaged, do their homework. I, you, you know, Maria, I cannot imagine how, how unbelievably difficult, how impossible it's been for a parent that's a single mom right now, if you're a single mom, you're trying to hold yeah. ends together. You maybe have three, four, five kids at home trying to get them online. And what we're seeing tragically is for millions of kids that they're not getting an education right now. They're not logging yeah. in online. And, 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 you know, this was initially we were told, OK, this, this is cost. just going to be a week or two to flatten the curve. Well, this has gone from yeah. a week or two to months to, 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 to now we're coming up on, on half a year. And, and 
if it continues, there's a whole generation of kids that, that is at risk of being lost. And, and, and so yeah. I have legislation. It's included in my bill, the Recovery Act. But actually, the Senate voted on my school choice legislation last week. What it provides is $5 billion of federal tax credits for contributions right. to scholarship granting organizations that give scholarships for K through 12 education. And it's matching dollars. Yep. And what that means, let's take the state of Texas. State of Texas, we've got 29 million people. It would mean that, that in the next year, there would be an additional $500 million in scholarships in Texas. So that if you're a mom Sorry, at home and, you, and, and you're not, your yeah. kids aren't getting educated, you can get a scholarship to find a school that will give an education to your kids, and it's an injection of new cash. And I got to tell you, I'm sorry to say, Republicans were united, supported my school choice legislation. Mm. Every single Democrat voted against it. Every single Democrat voted to leave those kids trapped w without providing the relief they need. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Look, I want to get to two more things. We only have a couple of seconds here, a couple of minutes, rather. Yep. But your young girls that you have, which is why your red flag antennas went up when you saw Netflix promoting this show called Cuties. Uh, it's extremely disturbing to me as well. You sent a letter to the Justice Department asking whether or not uh, they've they've done something wrong by promoting cuties. Yep. You want to know whether there should be an investigation into Netflix. Tell me about that real quick, because I want to get your take on China before we go. Well, this movie Cuties, it, it sexualizes 11-year-old girls, has them dancing like strippers, has them in very suggestive sexual roles. And, and, and it's, it's frankly disgusting. Uh, kids ought to be it preserved is, is. and, and we ought to protect video. them. And, 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 you know, Netflix is an incredibly proper, uh, profitable U.S. company. Barack Obama makes a ton of money from Netflix. And they are profiting. They, they are making money by selling the sexual exploitation of young kids. And so I asked the attorney general to investigate them because federal law makes it a crime. It is a felony to distribute child pornography. And, and you know, it's interesting online. Lots of so-called journalists were defending. Well, it's just a movie. You know what? We arrest and put in jail people every year for movies. If you have child pornography, if you have kids engaged in sexual activities, if you produce it, if you distribute it, you face criminal penalties. Yeah. And Netflix is making a ton of money. I guarantee you every pedophile in America is going to watch this movie and that Netflix is sitting back fat and happy making money on it. That, that, that's not right. Unbelievable. And you would think that suburban house women would be with you on that as well, by the way, going into this election. Real quick before we go, Senator, on China, uh, in terms of where we are, there will be a very different approach depending on who wins this election in terms of our long term relationship with China. Yes. Absolutely. China is, I believe, the single greatest geopolitical threat facing the United States for the next century. Donald Trump, one yeah. of the most significant things he's done as president on foreign policy is stand up to China. And he's changed the debate. He has stood up vigorously to China. Now, I think in the second term, he needs to stand up even stronger to China. But Joe Biden has right. spent 57 years, 47 years, rather, just kissing up to China, saying China's not a mm. threat, saying China's our friends, saying we should be in bed more with China. Don't worry about the communists murdering yeah. and torturing and stealing. Let's go make some money. This election, if you want communist China to have more power in America, Joe Biden's your guy. Actually, even Nancy Pelosi said that in an interview that China wants Joe yeah. Biden to win. That's not good for America. Senator, thanks so much for joining us this morning. It is good to see you, sir. We appreciate your time. Senator Ted Cruz.